Ladies and gentlemen, can we put our hands together? <laughs> Honorable Minister and uh, Our Excellency Susan, yes, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, this formally launches and uh, opens the dissemination of our public investment financing strategy. Welcome, welcome. You have just been watching the public launch and dissemination of the PIFS, something very critical for our financial systems here in Uganda. But we have even more critical conversations that we're going to be having this afternoon, especially today with today. And today being a celebration of something that's very critical to us, not just now, but even in the future. Today, the 21st of March, Tuesday, the 21st of March, happens to be a celebration world over of something so critical and yet so often ignored. Today is the International Day of Forests, and today we celebrate the 2023 version of this particular day. And joining me in that discussion to have a conversation about forests and health and healthy forests for healthy people. Join me in welcoming my guests today. Uh, furthest from me is Zainab Kakunguru, who is the Program Officer for Capacity Development at a Food and Agriculture Organization in Uganda. Welcome, Zainab. Thank you, and good afternoon, our viewers. Sitting right next to me uh, is, uh, joining us is Issa Katwesije, who happens to be the Acting Assistant Commissioner for Planning and Development in the Ministry of Water and Environment. Welcome, Issa. Yeah, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, our viewers. Indeed. Kitui Flo is my name, and today we're going to be talking about the importance of forests. But first, let's have a look so we can understand why this conversation is very critical. Life is about balance, about give and take. And forests give us so much. They purify our water. They clean our air. They fight climate change by capturing carbon. They give us food, life-saving medicines, and they improve our well-being. But our forests are vulnerable. They are endangered by fires, pests, droughts, and other threats. That is why we need to look after them. We need to give, not only take. Healthy forests for healthy people. Now, as much as forests are very critical to the health of people as well, it's been a little bit challenging for us here in Uganda. In 2020, forest cover was up to 29% of the total land area. As we speak, it's gone down to about 15%. That's almost half of the forestry cover that we had back then. And as much as it probably doesn't seem to affect you as an individual directly in the short run, it's definitely something, a conversation we need to have about the long run. And that's why I have you as my guests to have this conversation with. So I'll start with you, Issa, as we talk about this. Um, given the background, we've talked about just how important forests are, and we're talking about how quickly um, the forest cover here in Uganda is diminishing. Let's get into the Day of Forests, the International Day of Forests, is it important? What does it mean for us as Ugandans? What does yes. it mean for the world? Yeah, uh, thank you. Of course, the International Day of Forests is uh, meant to, it's a commemoration of uh, what our responsibility should be as yeah. human beings and as inhabitants of the earth. And uh, it's a call upon us to, to be more responsible in the way we manage the environment in the way we manage our forests, in the way we manage our trees. So since uh, the day was designated, of course every year it has a, a different theme. Uh, this year it's forests and health. And of course uh, it can't be better than now that uh, yes, we use the day to remind people that uh, forestry is a complete way of life. Mm. Um, it's uh, to do with uh, energy, it's got to do with industry, it's got to do with Construction is got to do with our own health. And uh, when it comes to this year's theme, uh, forestry and health, of course, it speaks more to the communities in which we live, uh, both uh, the urban and uh, the rural, 
but mainly for the urban, of course, it's one thing that uh, we have a current projection of uh, the global population to be uh, over 70% living in urban areas by the year 2050. And of course, it doesn't mean that uh, uh, the people will be moving to towns, but it's the towns that are spreading into the villages, meaning that uh, we lose the forests, we lose the trees as uh, human settlement expands. And with that, of course, there are a number of, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, 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 interventions that are designed and uh, programs and standards to make us live that way. But to achieve a healthy living uh, within uh, the communities that we live, uh, there is a principle, a theory that reads, um, that is about 330, 300, that every human being to achieve the benefits of nature, to achieve the benefits that come with the forest conservation, that achieve, um, we need to at least be able to see three trees from inside our house. And then the community in which we live should at least have 30% forest cover or tree cover. And then uh, you should be living at least 300 meters from the neighboring green park. So, and that is designed to improve uh, to commit to a healthy living for us as humans. But so, that is the ideal. Yeah, that's the ideal. And, uh, and why we have these days is to remind people that it's our responsibility to create this kind of awareness that yes, uh, if you don't have that ideal situation, then move towards that. At least make sure that you have the three trees in your compound um, like that, yes, and if the neighbor does the same, probably you'll have more than 30% of the forest cover. And when it comes to urban planning, uh, it would mean that, uh, yes, as we do that, then uh, the urban councils are committed, are driven more into making sure that there are these green parks uh, for healthy living in towns. Okay, yeah. so um, one thing that you've pointed out very critically is what the ideal picture should be, what mm. we should have, what we would call the sustainable forests that we, yes. that we want to see happening in and around us. Let's talk about that, Zainab. How is the Food and Agriculture Organization supporting government to ensure we have such a sustainable model? Mm. Because if we talk realistically, when you look at both rural and um, even even the urban communities, forests are a very huge source of some of the things that we need mm -hmm. for everyday life. I mean, uh, we, I know that's a conversation we're going to get into, but a very huge chunk of our people use forests for energy, for example. So is the government doing something, and how is the Food and Agriculture Organization helping them to do that? Um, thank you, uh, Kitui. Um, as the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, we have a vision to realize a world where every human being has access to sufficient food that is able to sustain a quality lifestyle. But then we also realize that uh, to sustainably produce food is not possible without responsible management of the environment. Mm. So that's why actually within our portfolio of programming, of activities that are critical to our partnership with the government, there is a huge component on managing natural resources, and in this case, specifically forests. Um, like you said in your statistics, we have over time, I, I mean, we are realizing that the forest resource is shrinking. Mm. And if the forest resource is shrinking, it means even us as FAO, I mean, it's, it's increasingly becoming difficult for us to realize our mandate or our goal of a zero hunger world because, uh, I mean, forests or sustainable forests are an enabler for us to be able to achieve the sustainable food production. So uh, in partnership with, uh, you know, different development partners and the government, uh, ministries and departments, uh, we have implemented a number of initiatives that are aimed at promoting sustainable management of, uh, of forests. And of course, these interventions are different depending on which particular you know, uh, problem we are addressing. Uh, for example, you realize he spoke about um, the increasing urbanization of uh, you know, our country, but uh, we know that urbanization comes with 
the need for constructing the you know the different mm. malls that you're seeing around town but where does this timber come Structural from? Structural growth has to be realized. Exactly. But where does, this, where does this timber come from? Mm. That means somebody has to go somewhere, either in Budongo or Mavira, mm. cut down some huge mahoganies to construct a mall somewhere. Yeah. But then how long does it take us to regrow the mahoganies? We would, it, we would need, for example, maybe... The rate of consumption versus the rate of replacement. Exactly. Is, yeah, so it yeah. would not be sustainable. So one of the interventions that we had was to actually promote commercial tree planting. You plant trees where, which you can harvest, and then we get this construction material. Because much as the forests are shrinking, the need for the wood resource is actually increasing. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, we, we had a, a big forestry program uh, funded by the European Union, yeah. quite a tune of about 16 million euros, and uh, we partnered with the ministry and the private sector. So uh, from this uh, initiative, we were able to support planting of about uh, 30,000 hectares. If we are to talk in terms of number of trees, that's about 35 million trees. Yeah. So we can see that by putting in place that forest, there is, uh, we are reducing pressure on the existing indigenous forests, which we need for their ecosystem functions. So that's one of the uh, programs that we, we implemented Impact together on. with the ministry. Yeah. And then um, we also know that uh, Uganda is one of the countries that uh, hosts actually the largest number of refugees almost in the world. But the influx of these refugees comes with um, degradation of the environment for the obvious reasons, the land, for, mm -hmm. you know, agri for agriculture. For settlement. And yeah, all uh, for settlement, for, for planting. So in partnership with UNHCR, we, uh, just at the end of last year, we launched a, a forest landscape restoration plan for BDBD refugee settlement. We know that there has been a lot of uh, environmental degradation within the BDBD refugee settlement, mm. but we needed a framework to inform what kind of interventions need to be done uh, within the refugee settlement to abate environmental degradation that was happening there. So um, we have this framework in place, and it's, uh, it's a very important tool to inform the government and development partners of what should be done within this settlement to curb the problem of increasing environmental degradation. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, as the FAO, we have already earmarked some resources actually to initiate, you know, to implement some of the activities within uh, our forest landscape uh, restoration plan for BDBD. And we hope that we can do this even for maybe other refugee settlements. Mm -hmm. And maybe the last uh, but not least mm -hmm. is um, our currently ongoing project on forest management and sustainable charcoal value chain. Um, I think uh, most of us most, most likely watched uh, 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 a video uh, that went viral recently of a former, M a former member of parliament in the Acholi region who was deflating a car that was carrying charcoal. Uh, but what that points to us is that uh, there's definitely a problem. Uh, we're having an increasing demand for wood energy, which is uh, charcoal and firewood. And yet, like, just like uh, the timber, the supply is dwindling. So what's happening is that we're having a lot of destruction of these forests. Um, if you have been observing maybe the trends, uh, in the past, say, 15, 10 to 15 years, most of the charcoal was coming from, say, around uh, Luero, Nakasongola, Nakaseke, basically within the central cattle corridor. But what has happened is most of these forests around there are, deplet are, are depleted. Yeah. So what is happening? We have these charcoal producers. They have moved now up north. They are in Gulu, Amuru, Ajumani. That's where now the charcoal production um, is taking place. Mm. And uh, what, hap what happens is uh, we, ha we now have the central cattle corridor area bare. Mm. And then I don't, I don't know what they leave behind a wake of destruction. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what's going to, uh, I always wonder what is going to happen in the next maybe 10, 15 years. Yeah. When we're done with the north, we probably will move to Sudan. I don't know. It's going to be a problem. <laughs> it's it's definitely going to be a problem. Be a problem. Yeah. And I'm actually glad that you've talked about that, yeah. mm. which brings us to some of the things that you've mentioned are policy things. Some of these are policy decisions, things that ideally the ministries should be able to deal with. 
but policy is not quite enough. So mm. just allow me uh, b back to you, Isa. When you talk about uh, the Ugandan population, about 88%, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, are dependent on wood fuel. Mm. We've all had that moment where you're driving up country or back and you stop to pick charcoal to, to bring. And it's, it's, it's not because of the fact that we'd like to see the, the forest destroyed, but this is how we survive as a, as a population. Mm. Because certain alternatives aren't very affordable, they're not very realistic. And we'll get into those discussions about the alternatives with you, uh, Zainab. But tell me, how is the ministry planning to avert this problem? Because you see, for as long as we're still dependent mm. on wood fuel, policy won't help us, nothing's going to change uh, the issues at hand. Yeah, that's true. And uh, thank you, uh, Kitui. Um, yes, it's, it's been a concern. It's still a concern. We all use biomass uh, for cooking, at least uh, for now. That is what we're using. And uh, like you mentioned about the alternatives, yes, of course, it's, uh, uh, they are through the roof in terms of cost. And uh, some of them, actually, the perception is that not user friendly. Yeah, but then uh, why it's uh, important for us to remind ourselves um, uh, on a day like this one is about a call to action for everyone to be responsible about how we're doing this. Yes, knowing that uh, it's a challenge, yes, and uh, Zainab actually mentioned about uh, uh, the issue of charcoal in northern Uganda, and actually it's worse than we're seeing on the roads because most of these uh, traders or the people who actually burn the charcoal, they move into uh, villages, uh, cut down everything, uproot the root system, uh, turn everything into charcoal, and then move. And as we speak, there is actually a ban uh, on charcoal uh, movement uh, for the whole of uh, northern Uganda. And it's not that uh, uh, the ministry just imposed it. It was uh, a request from the region uh, to do exactly that. Uh, but at the same time, it's not like, uh, yes, of course, whenever we put bans, they are basically temporal measures. Mm. But uh, it gives us a chance to uh, reevaluate, to do that self-reflection on how uh, we are going to get out of the mm. situation. Because when you ban, uh, when you put a ban on Northern Uganda, like she said, we'll it, move it to moves, Sudan. It moves we'll, elsewhere. We'll find yes, it somewhere. But the ban is about um, movement uh, from out to outside uh, individual districts. Yeah. Yeah, but um, uh, locally for domestic consumption, yes, uh, people can uh, continue using charcoal. But what we are doing at the moment, like she mentioned about uh, a bioenergy uh, project that is mainly looking at uh, establishing, uh, establishing uh, bioenergy forests, like deliberate plantations uh, targeting for production of charcoal and uh, biomass fuel wood. And then uh, with that, of course, it comes with a number of technologies because whoever is doing sustainable production uh, is actually supported in uh, making sure that uh, they, they earn out of uh, this improved input. And uh, with that, of course, it comes with a high efficiency kilns, uh, which we are trying to put in place, so that uh, even from the little wood that is available, the, 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 the output in terms of charcoal that comes out of uh, this wood is almost commensurate with mm. the input wood that is being put in. And we're partnering with a, a number higher of, CPC. Yes. So we're partnering with uh, some NGOs, uh, especially for that region. But it's something that is uh, also uh, cascading to the other parts of the country, mainly to look at efficiency. But uh, at the same time, of course, uh, there are some policy instruments, some of them fiscal, uh, that uh, go beyond Ministry of Water. Because as Ministry of Water and Environment, um, our job is to enhance the stock of the raw material because uh, we're not going to wean ourselves from uh, uh, charcoal fuel firewood use in the short term but in the meantime we have to make sure that we're sustainably producing uh, this uh, fuel wood and uh, for both charcoal and uh, and firewood but even for industry because the bulk of that goes to domestic consumption so as we do that uh, in terms of uh, uh, energy efficiency yes we also reach out to the ministry of energy which is more on the side of uh, the consumption for the most part. Uh, there have been collective efforts uh, through appeal by the Ministry of Water to Ministry of Energy in terms of conservation and Ministry of Finance to look at the tax regimes on the alternatives. 
And uh, as we see it, actually, there has been, uh, the entities have been responsive, where um, uh, we have um, uh, some promotional uh, agenda within Ministry of Energy. Like, for example, there is a current move to support people with uh, uh, LPG gas cylinders. And then also, uh, there is a program called Fumbi Sayaka. Ideally, it's meant to, of course, there is a lot that needs to be improved, but at least it's a good gesture and a move in the right direction. But yeah. if you ask me, as an individual, I think, uh, yes, there are other technologies that are probably much cheaper or come along uh, within the same price range. For example, when you look at the cost of a gas cylinder and say maybe a pressure cooker, of course, the gas cylinder will still push this farmer or the user, a domestic household, to keep going back to the petrol station to refill. And uh, when you look at the cost in terms of comparison, of course, uh, it's not every day that uh, money will be available. Mm. But uh, when you look at, say, things like a pressure cooker, which reduces the cooking time of, uh, of some of these things that take a long time to cook, like beans and uh, a number of parsley, uh, you'll find that, uh, yes, irrespective of whether you're using... Energy being used. Yes, whether you're using firewood or charcoal or electricity, if you're using a pressure cooker, actually, the cooking time reduces immeasurably. I mean, it reduces quite heavily um, uh, from maybe two or three hours, say beans and peas, to less than 20 minutes. And uh, that is very important. So we think, yes, uh, the LPG is good enough, but then we also need to increase awareness about these other alternatives mm. that actually uh, improve the efficiency. But uh, that said, uh, we have uh, a program, uh, we have programs that are meant to create <coughs> most awareness to make us self-sustaining and on the other part uh, there is the aspect of sustainable procurement on the side of government that working with the Ministry of Finance that actually uh, when you look at the consumption of wood because ideally whatever comes from, uh, uh, from the forest is either used as construction material or as firewood and uh, we're moving to have um, unless we have that aspect incorporated within the PPDA Act, government being the biggest consumer uh, of, uh, of most of the forest products, and looking at that, pushing government that in other sectors, be it in education or construction works, to make sure that, yes, whatever we are using is sustainably sourced, is legally sourced, so that, yes, people follow the rules and, uh, and, uh, and do a responsible extraction of these things. So yes, and we go ahead to encourage people to try and sustain ourselves by making sure that yes, every human being has their uh, carbon footprint, mm. that actually yes, we can at the same time use the wood, but we can also uh, plant wood for our own uh, use. It might okay. not be, yeah. Thank okay. you. I, I love that you brought in the aspect of the carbon footprints and mm. uh, I think one of the most important things that the Food and Agriculture Organization is doing is trying to achieve certain climate goals. But a lot of the uh, alternatives that you gave us, a lot of the projects that you told us you're working on, mostly work towards reversing the deforestation that's already happened. Mm. Let's get into a deeper discussion on how we now strike a balance, mm. especially going forward. How do we access both um, energy and at the same time maintain a healthy environment going forward? Because I know a lot of the ones we're doing now, we're trying to, to undo the mistakes mm. that we've done previously. Mm. Mm. But going forward, how do we do that? How do we get that balance? Um, thank you again, uh, Kitui. Um, actually, the question of access to energy and then environmental sustainability is a dilemma you know balancing the two is a dilemma especially to us in the developing world reason being i mean looking at an example of our country we have over 80 percent of our population still relying on biomass as their main source of energy so which means basically it's it's um it, it's still a challenge to access, uh, you know, alternatives, other energy alternatives, yeah. um, you know, like uh, Issa says. So um, I think what we need to do is, uh, because on the one side, we need the energy for our cooking. Yeah. On the other side, we have, we need, we need to conserve the forests. Mm. So um, I think what we need to, uh, to acknowledge first as, um, as a country is that, uh, it will take us some time, basically, to transition from 
uh, extreme biomass, dependence mm. on biomass to other energy alternatives. It's, um, it's a goal, it's a vision that definitely we should, you know, passionately pursue, but um, it's going to be a gradual process. So I would think that uh, what we need to do is uh, look at, we have uh, the short-term measures, which is to sustainably manage what we have at the moment, um, sustainably manage the wood value chain, basically. Reduce dependence on the natural forests. Let's establish, say, wood energy plantations, like he said. If instead of somebody going to Babira to cut down firewood, let them have a small wood lot in their home from which they can get the firewood. Or if it's a charcoal producer, instead of going somewhere in a muru in a forest and clear the forest, if we can have a program where we can support them to grow the wood for energy as a short-term measure, mm. I think that would be good. Uh, but then also, let's not forget our goal that uh, we need to transition and move away from our traditional biomass energy. So we also need slowly, to... Slowly, like you said. Slowly. It's going to be a gradual process, but let's not... We can't give up. We have to keep trying. But uh, in our trying, I think uh, the government uh, has a big role to play, especially in terms of uh, policy, because uh, most of the challenges or the barriers for people to, to, to switch to energy alternatives is affordability, accessibility, because of the, you know, the, 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 the cost implication, really, uh, some of which uh, Isa has already mentioned. Okay. So I think we need to be realistic and have our short-term measure of transitioning so that even once we have transitioned, we don't leave behind a completely destroyed environment. Let's manage the process, let's manage the transition process as we move to cleaner energy. But then um, also important to note is that uh, the energy problem needs to be approached in an integrated manner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to look at how to sustainably use the biomass, mm -hmm. but then also, you know, again, re-emphasizing, not forgetting, you know, uh, transitioning to cleaner energy. Absolutely. We have demonstrated this through all the different programs that we have done. We mm -hmm. have demonstrated, for example, that we can use uh, biogas mm -hmm. in some of our projects. We are supporting, we are go actually putting our, our energy behind the government program of, of promoting LPG. Uh, we have worked in refugee camps and uh, on programs that are promoting uh, more efficient cook stoves. So yeah. it's possible and I'm sure we can gradually transition without leaving behind a destroyed environment. Absolutely, and I completely agree with you. And of course, all of this, like you said, is one step at a time and one reminder at a time. As we Absolutely. started this conversation, uh, every celebration of International Day of the Forest is a reminder for you and me to do our part. So mm -hmm. as we close, um, thank you so much for being a part of, of, of this discussion today. And I'm hoping that everybody has understood just how critical it is. Are we celebrating this day and how? Yes, um, as uh, Ministry of Water and Environment, um, this day has, was brought forward. Uh, previously, it's been uh, the week starting uh, um, March 20th okay. up to uh, uh, March 25th, 26th, uh, through uh, the Uganda Water and Environment Week. Yes. And uh, it's a commemoration. It's a week to commemorate uh, three international days. Yeah. The International Day of Forests on 21st, uh, the World Water Day on March 22nd, yeah. and uh, the World Meteorological Day on March uh, 23rd. So right. we celebrated this uh, last week under the theme, Water and Environment for Climate Resilient Development. Ah, yeah. very good, very good. You can celebrate in your own way by planting a tree today mm -hmm. so that you can make your contribution to a forest sustainable, sustainable forest for the future. Two Flo is my name. Thank you so much to Zainab Kakunguru, who is the Program Officer, uh, Capacity Development at the Food and Agriculture Organization in Uganda, and Issa Katwesije, who is the uh, uh, Acting Assistant Commissioner, Planning and Development at the Ministry of Water and Environment. It's been a lovely afternoon. We're getting into news to keep you updated on what's happening in and around Uganda and the world. Keep it here on NBS TV, your number one TV station. NBS happening now.